Uh, hello, my name is Yavana Knezhevich, and I am the Associate Director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies uh, here at Stanford. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you all, our students and our um, colleagues and our guests, to our uh, first event of the uh, winter quarter. Uh, it is my uh, pleasure to introduce today Dr. Luka uh, Nahutsrishvili who teaches critical theory at the Ilya State University in Tbilisi, Georgia. Uh, he holds a PhD in comparative literature and an MA in philosophy. Uh, between 2015 and 2017, he was a postdoctoral fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation at the Zentrum für Literatur und Kulturforschung in Berlin. Uh, and in 2019-20, uh, uh, the Shoda uh, Rustaveli National Science Foundation of Georgia awarded him with a fellowship for the best young scientist in the humanities. Uh, he has taught as a visiting lecturer at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. And uh, this past fall uh, was a Fulbright visiting scholar at the Department of Anthropology uh, at NYU. Um, where he pursued a transdisciplinary ethnographic inquiry into the making of and resistance to different projects of modernization uh, in Georgia from the time of czarist rule to post-Soviet independence. And we will be hearing um, about some of that research uh, in his presentation today. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, joining us today. And just a word about um, format. Um, after the presentation, uh, we will have um, about 15, maybe 20 minutes uh, for Q&A. So uh, please feel free to submit uh, any questions you might have using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and uh, I will be back on, uh, on screen uh, at the end of the presentation uh, for the moderated Q&A. Uh, so without further ado, um, I will pass it over to our speaker. Um, thank you, Giovanna. Um, I'm extremely happy to be here and to have this opportunity to really be here. So um, um, in both in Stanford uh, physically and in this virtual format um, uh, that permits us to connect with um, um, others who are far away. Um, and I will just um, start by um, sharing my screen um, and um, make a small announcement. Um, but while, while I was writing um, uh, my paper about the customary oath that people in the Georgian Caucasus swore on Orthodox icon to resist the project of the Hudoni uh, Dam, uh, basically reality kicked in uh, and turned my plans upside down because just a week ago, people in Svanetti once again resorted to an oath um, on the icon of St. George, but this time the occasion was not a large scale infrastructural project imposed by the neoliberal state. Um, it was to settle the problem of crypto mining that is overstraining and disrupting energy supply for the region uh, in this cold winter. I would therefore like to start by relating what uh, happened last week. Um, these fresh developments have even obliged me to um, slightly deviate from the um, announced title um, and abstract of my talk. Um, initially, I was planning to um, concentrate just on the oath sworn in uh, 2013 against the dam um, as a special event shedding light on uh, many systemic issues in contemporary Georgia, as well as revealing um, uh, the workings of particular uh, historical legacies. What I propose uh, now is to provide uh, um, a longer history of oath taking uh, in Svanetti with the oaths uh, um, against the dam and against crypto mining uh, as the most recent instances where the double problematic uh, of uh, environmental struggle and popular forms of um, um, doing politics come together. And this overview has no ambition to be um, um, exhaustive. It's a mix of uh, historical research, uh, my own fieldwork with uh, uh, the anti-dam activists, um, and the recent media reports and personal communications concerning the um, oath against crypto mining. So I'll just, I'll just start uh, by this. Um, 
Over the past years, Georgia has become one of the leading countries to dedicate um, much of its um, uh, national power consumption to crypto mining, which, as you know, requires an enormous amount of energy. No other factor can account for the dramatic increase in energy consumption, given that the country experienced total deindustrialization in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. That complete deregulation has made Georgia uh, a Bitcoin paradise is also one of the acknowledged reasons why the neoliberal state insists on building more than 120 uh, new hydropower plants, while the country still lacks any overarching um, energy strategy. As for Svaniti, it, make, uh, it mainly became uh, a mining hub because the state is subsidizing electricity as an incentive um, for the local population to not abandon the highest and coldest populated area in Georgia. Um, Svaneti thus finds itself pulled into a vicious circle where uh, its rivers are being overexploited for more and more hydropower only to provide energy for crypto mining. While the oligarch and former prime minister Bidzina Ivanishvili and his affiliates are considered to possess the largest mining farms, Svans themselves seem to be increasingly involved in generating cryptocurrency, thus causing power disruptions um, it is now threatening the tourist season also, on which the uh, economy of the region depends as the most sought after tourist destination in, in Georgia. This is why after days of futile protests on the streets um, calling for the state to regulate mining, on the 13th of December, the locals reverted to a customary means of conflict resolution. One male representative of each family from the district of Nestia was summoned to the local St. John Church, St. George Church to swear on its icon that anyone who possesses a crypto miner would from now on turn it off. Those who would not would be punished by St. George for perjury or whereas those who were absent were handed over to the icon, as Svans used to say. The news that Svans were gathering to swear on an icon to combat crypto mining went viral on Georgian social media and news platforms, giving it a nationwide public prominence that the Svans, who in 2013 uh, had sworn against the Hudoni Dam, could only have dreamt of. On Facebook, users massively started to mock the event as idolatry and obscurantism, or by rhetorically asking, are we heading back to the Middle Ages? What century are we in? Uh, the more sophisticated benignly ironized about their eclectic homeland and its crypto paganism, with ancient oaths and St. George being pitted against a hypermodern phenomenon such as crypto mining. A smaller number of voices sympathized with the Svans as morally adroit mountaineers who still haven't lost fear of God and know the value of words. In the end, both sides seem to join in attributing to the Svans certain qualities that make for their fundamental difference. Um, in fact, we could say with Paul Manning that the very same qualities for which the Svans are considered the purest and more pristine representatives of Georgian stock and traditional culture also makes them the objects of many an anecdote of primitive uh, or barbaric backwardness. Turning mostly around uh, male Svans, these uh, anecdotes reproduce the stereotype of the stubborn, ferocious mountaineer with his distinctive round hat, fortified in his ancestral tower, and ready to plunk into the next blood feud. This difference is enhanced by uh, his strongly accented Georgian, as Svans speak a separate language that is related to, but mutually unintelligible with Georgian. Aware of the perceptions of lowlanders, the Spans did their best to emphasize uh, that it was the inefficiency of the state itself that had obliged them to turn to their customs. Without delay, the positional media forged headlines such as the state has sent Svaneti back to the Middle Ages, alluding at once uh, to obscurantist traditions and uh, to power outage. Another headline was uh, even more emphatic about the absence of a functioning, that is modern state, uh, claiming the state has been replaced by tradition. While the journalists appeal to the colloquial sense of the Middle Ages, Svanetti in fact boasts uh, um, a long tradition of oath taking, starting at least from the medieval period. Across the centuries for Svans, oaths on icons have been pillars of political self-organization, always standing in some sort of uh, relation to some sort of state, be it in absence of, in indifference, or in opposition to a state. Um, oaths have also been a 
it's, it's still are part of the everyday functioning of customary law, again, in absence, in parallel, or in a more engaged interaction with some sort of state law. Uh, it is these historically varying ways of um, uh, relating to a state that I want to selectively outline to um, grasp the already mentioned difference that sanity has come to embody uh, in relation to um, the Georgian political body or political imagination. Considered in the respective historical context, the Svan oaths can be seen as instances of what Bruce Grant has identified as the many alternative approaches to sovereignty and community for which the Caucasus region has long been um, uh, known. As Grant emphasizes, these forms of sovereignty are not incomplete or lacking only because they do not conform to the ideal of sovereignty that the nation state pretends to realize, Rather, there are different forms altogether, even as they might be competing, overlapping, or interpenetrating with the logics of the nation state. Uh, attending to these dynamics will ultimately help us recognize what kinds of historical transformations the recent oaths against uh, hydropower plants and um, crypto mining have come to register as they interact with predatory exploitation uh, of energy resources and the disruption of social uh, and ecosystems in the post-Soviet neoliberal uh, Georgian nation state. Uh, now let's briefly review the uh, notorious uh, Middle Ages. Mm. So since the uh, 13th century, the highest parts of uh, Svaneti constituted what is known as free lordless Svaneti, a non-feudal organization based um, on regularly renewed alliances uh, between segmentary highland communities. Uh, Nino Kinashvili defines uh, um, them as an, um, free Svaneti as an overarching political framework beyond tribal or household units um, it was forged by way of pledging oaths in the face of God. Um, historically, a central procedure in the customary law of all Georgian regions, such oaths were usually performed on Orthodox icons, given the special power with which Eastern Christianity invests icons as channels establishing contact with God. In contrast to the secular icons in use today, even when they appeal to divine power, an indispensable part of a religious oath is a curse imposed on oneself, an invocation of divine power to punish the sphere if the oath were to be broken or false. Okinashvili also draws our attention to the constitutive role of religious commemoration producing the lordless community um, of the Svans. Uh, in this double practice of swearing and commemoration, Akinashri tells us, uh, men and women, regardless of social status, lay and religious persons, the living and the dead came to be salvaged as a community that extended from this life to the afterworld. Fulfilling an integral political, legal, religious function, um, um, these oaths also became the pillars of the um, of the rules that the alliance of the Svan communities um, generated to um, regulate personal familial feuds, uh, um, um, the substituting also um, self-justice um, with um, the kind of legal formation uh, we now regard as Svan customary law. Um, as stateless oaths, as oaths taken outside of a state and against any larger or sovereign entity that might want to invade, these oaths can be said to have been responsible for integrating social, political, and religious power and for making the political form of um, organization essentially undistinguishable from the community itself. Um, it is true that the self-curse that constituted the power of the oath uh, invoked God as the only instance ultimately in charge of punishment, but as oaths before God formed the fundamental procedure for the community to constitute and reconstitute uh, itself, this very constitutive quality of the oaths bestowed upon the community the sovereign political mandate to collectively decide to exclude perpetrators, that is, those who had broken the oath that had constituted that community. Um, in Svaniti, uh, a system loosely functioning along these lines uh, um, of community and sovereignty lasted until the uh, mid 19th century when the Russian Empire started to encircle it by um, obtaining loyalty from uh, um, the princes ruling in the feudal parts of Svaniti. Um, ultimately, the lordless communities too voluntarily accepted the legitimacy of uh, um, imperial rule while largely retaining the customary framework in administrative and legal matters. 
But after the resistant North uh, Caucasian uh, peoples um, had been subjected uh, by the start of the um, um, 1870s, the empire found more time for free, uh, free sanity as well. Uh, in 1875, um, the Svans from the Lordless communities uh, heard that the Tsarist government intended to measure and tax their lands. They immediately assembled to swear to resist the government, were, um, uh, the government to try to further curb uh, their autonomy. Uh, and yet, uh, the days were long gone when the Svans would reproduce their community through regular oaths that indivisibly assured a religious, political, and legal uh, order. The oath of uh, um, 1875 was only um, a singular discrete uh, event uh, deprived from its earlier constitutive function. Uh, it was rather an oath of rebellion against an imperial state uh, done from within uh, the structures of a state. Um, and in what one eyewitness of the rebellion describes as a cascade of uh, misunderstandings between the locals and officials, um, this rebellion ended uh, with the burning down of uh, the village Halde, whose inhabitants had refused to surrender um, um, and then uh, there was a military tribunal. On this trial, prominent members of the Georgian nationalist intelligentsia volunteered to join the Georgian lawyers in the rebels' defense. But this defense came to articulate a profound colonial difference that the intelligentsia shared with the imperial administration and that would continue to shape the Svans' fate after the end of the Russian Empire as well. Uh, the Svans were not only presented as improper Christians and children of nature, unable to understand the benefits of imperial reforms, but also as Georgians gone wild, speaking a degraded version of Georgian that the Highlanders supposedly ended up with after losing touch with the plains. For the lawyers, the rebellion only demonstrated how much the Svans were in need to be restored to their true national religious identity and to be educated into being modern law-abiding citizens. They had been left too long without the proper legal and religious guidance of a state, making the rebellion nothing but an anxious overreaction on the part of a half-conscious child at the sudden apparition uh, of the state. These appeals um, to the Svans' civilizational lag had no little role in having the death sentence committed to um, lifelong uh, exile in Siberia. What remained, besides the ruins of Khalde, was a Svan folk song, Gaul uh, praising the valiant fight of the sons of Khalde. <laughs> In 2013, this song re-emerged at a rally in the Svan village Haishi in relation to an event which was said to have entailed the first mass scale swearing on an icon since the rebellion of 1875. Gaul Gavre indeed seemed like a tiger's sleep into the past, um, to quote Walter Benjamin as a spontaneous, self-evidently relevant citation in the face of the renewed advance um, of the uh, post-Soviet Georgian state that decided to revive the Soviet project of the massive Hudoni hydropower plant a project that had been abandoned in the wake of perestroika when uh, nationalist and environmentalist protests overlapped. Planned in the valley of the Nguri River, just above the famous Nguri Dam, which remains the sixth highest um, um, dam in the world and an awe-inspiring monument to Soviet modernization and its natural and human cost, the Hudoni Dam uh, would no less dramatically lead um, the flood, to the flooding of all 13 villages of the community of Haishi, its church and graveyards, and the resettlement of more than 200 uh, households. Um, but what did the people assembled in 2013 to sing Gaul um, have in common with the spans of uh, 1875, you might ask? Arguably, the 150 years or so that lie between them contain a break that is more fundamental than any change the Svans had experienced across um, dozens of centuries. As we unpack the conflict between the technocratic nation, nation state and its Svan citizens, we will have to consider what Talal Assad would call um, the historical grammar, that is, 
the specific historical conditions which made for an oath to become the main tool of resistance in contemporary Svaneti. Um, as we will see, uh, the grammar of this oath was informed by the Svans' all-encompassing experience of Soviet modernization and the transformations in the wake of the formation of an independent post-Soviet Georgian nation state. Um, now, the immediate reason for the people of Haishi to uh, have pledged an oath of resistance was the rapid disillusionment uh, with the Georgian Dream Coalition, led and financed by the billionaire Ivanishvili, um, a coalition which won uh, the parliamentary elections of October 2012, uh, um, um, uh, which pushed Mikhail Saakashvili's neoliberal government out of office. Um, on his visit to Haishi during the uh, election campaign, Ivanishvili had personally promised the worried locals that no energy project would be undertaken at the cost of uprooting people from their homes. However, as soon as the elections had been won, hydropower plants were quickly back on the agenda. The pressure on the people of Haishi increased and rumors were spread among other Svans that the only intention of the position against the dam was to bargain a higher compensation for resettlement than offered by the transnational company. Um, now prime minister of the country, Ivanishvili started calling upon the Svans to embrace the flooding of their villages and sacred sites for the sake of development, national interest and energy independence. Ivanishvili had thus broken his promise. In a later appeal to national and international institutions, the Haishi community commented accordingly uh, on Ivanishvili's um, uh, promise. I quote, since October 2012, this rhetoric uh, has changed uh, radically, but we have not, end of quote. In fact, um, in May 2013, the Svans of Haishi went on to prove their own constancy by swearing their first oath on the icon of St. George at the local church, that they would not permit the construction of the dam. Resulting in a certain chain effect, um, the sworn male representatives of 57 families from Haishi were joined by 20 more families in September. In November, the third and largest event of oath taking took place with many more people from Haishi and the rest of Georgia joining in or attending the oath taking. Significantly, women usually excluded from the oaths due to the prohibition to approach icons, were able to associate themselves to it by signing its text that circulated in the form of a civic petition and that laid uh, next to the icon of St. George in front of the church entrance on the day of the big rally. Regarding um, the Svans appeal to Ivanishvili's uh, volatility and their own constancy, it could be observed uh, with Michael Hertzfeld that um, it is specifically in light of the perceived devaluation of words in modern times and within a modern bureaucratic state that the oath comes to stand as um, uh, a word, uh, an utterance that retains actual value uh, thanks to its reference to the divine word with the capital W. Here it is worth quoting uh, the declaration of one of the sworn from Haishi. Um, Today, the constitution is vagrant and any bureaucrat can manipulate it, uh, but the Svan oath on an icon is not like that. It has endured through centuries and is still in force. Whoever has sworn will not break the icon, even if you were the greatest scumbag. The oath on an icon will not be broken. You cannot put a price on it. It is not for sale. Uh, in what follows, I would like to explicate the various components of this quote, uh, which I regard as a concise expression of the multiple shifts that the Svan Oath reveals to have registered in um, a relationship with the Georgian nation state, uh, not to mention a new mode of thematizing the Oath and Svan identity itself. Um, if we consider the oath against the Hudoni Dam as the return of a political usage of Svan oath taking, uh, it is political in Karl Schmidt's emphatic sense of dividing between enemies and friends. Uh, in fact, when um, presenting themselves as men of their word, uh, the sworn were not only casting the state as the political adversary, no less importantly, they were uh, communicating their intransigence to fellow Svans through a familiar code. At the same time, the quote does not speak exclusively of the integrity of the oath against the dam, just this one uh, uh, oath. Um, it also speaks of Svan oath taking as such as an enduring practice. Um, in one of my interviews with the um, uh, principal organizer of the oath taking, um, a school teacher from Aishi, um, he explicitly cast this kind of uh, rhetoric in terms of tradition. Um, and he emphasized that he wanted tradition to be uh, understood as the active effort at handing down 
uh, a value like the integrity of the human word in reference to divine truth um, within secular historical um, um, time. Now, it is precisely um, um, such a contentious usage of the notion of tradition that I think um, somehow limits the usefulness of a concept like um, um, traditional ritual uh, with which the anti-dam oath has recently been framed as a local and pristine tradition in an otherwise very important article by Nino Antadze and Katie Gujaraidze. Um, to be sure, I also do not opt for the conceptual framework of uh, invented tradition because just uh, like the notion of traditional ritual, it still seems to presuppose tradition as a given thing. Um, instead, I argue that we should consider tradition, uh, religion, um, or custom, not as neutral descriptions, but as contested notions that acquire their meaning uh, within specific public conflicts between various interdependent claimants. And here I'm following uh, Barbara Janelidze's groundbreaking dissertation on the formation of secularity in Georgia, um, which is based on a critical dialogue with the so-called anthropology of the secular developed by Assad um, um, uh, or Saba Mahmoud or Charles Hirschking. Following their insight that um, uh, instead of presupposing uh, an uh, ideal division between power and religion or between an official hierarchical religion and popular customs, uh, which are supposedly devoid of power relations, uh, I think we must acknowledge the specific entanglement of religion and power, of custom and politics. Um, and in the case of the anti dam oath, we must look at how the Svans um, put claim on something like tradition in the first place, and how they oath engaged the hegemonic political and cultural order of the um, Georgian nation state, not so much by confronting it, but by subverting it from within the, the hegemonic, uh, hegemonic framework itself. Um, therefore, have to um, consider the broader political institutional uh, transformations that Svaneti went through from the Soviet to the post-Soviet configurations of state sovereignty. For these enabled the customary oath to be cast in terms of moral integrity and uh, the refusal of commodi uh, to commodify everything in contrast to a, a modern uh, state that sells everything. But these same transformations also allowed for a certain theologization of the oath, which seems at odds with the morality that the oath would like to enact. Uh, this is a contradiction that is present in the quote a claim that um, whoever has sworn um, will not break the icon, even if you were the greatest scumbag which seems to imply that you can be a scumbag uh, and remain faithful to the divine oath, suggesting uh, a disjunction of the religious relation to divine transcendence from the realm of uh, morality. In fact, uh, the understanding that predominated um, um, in the interviews I conducted with people uh, um, in and from Svaneti uh, was that Svan customary law was both much more humane than state law and more principled because of the already mentioned responsibility towards uh, divine transcendence, which strikes with punishment that is all the more cruel um, as it is induced um, by the breaking of an absolute obligation. Arguably, if Svans pretend to completely uh, hand over to a, a perfect and inscrutable transcendent force, um, the punishment that in the case of the state remains in the hands of imperfect human beings, um, the functioning of such a customary law um, uh, uh, nevertheless largely depends on the presence, um, presence of um, um, the very state that um, the Svans might tend to morally devalue. Um, as Jan Köhler has convincingly shown in his legal ethnography from early post-Soviet Svaneti, the strong presence of a state legal framework with its monopoly over coercion um, um, in the Soviet time uh, made possible for the everyday practice of Svan customary law to outsource coercive and retributive violence to the state, um, um, and with, which is basically what permitted um, um, uh, the Svan participants of um, customer litigations to concentrate on reconciliation and on moral satisfaction uh, that um, state law seemed unable to uh, provide. Köhler also um, clearly demonstrates that in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet um, um, monopoly on enforcing law, it became impracticable uh, uh, for the Svans to rely on this kind of transcendent uh, justice. Uh, this resulted in the rise of the notorious blood feuds uh, and a power disbalance that was based on nothing else than superiority of force, making Svaneti a no-go zone until um, 
In 2004, the Saakashvili government violently crushed the dominant clan in a ruthless um, gesture of assertion of territorial sovereignty. Um, and such assertion uh, basically was um, also the indispensable precondition for um, um, disclosing Svaneti for the first time since um, the Soviet period, uh, both as a tourist attraction uh, and as a source for the exploitation of hydropower. It is then against the background of such violent reintrusion of the post-Soviet state and the imposition of its legal administrative uh, frame that we have to un understand how the oath of 2013 worked. While the anti dam activists cited the rebellion of Halde, their oath um, um, was certainly no rebellion. While permanently emphasizing the principles of reconciliation and the finding of just measure characteristic for everyday customary litigations, the anti dam oath itself uh, certainly wasn't part of any such litigation. Stefan Böll and other ethnographers studying the Svans who were settled to the lowlands have argued that among them, customary law seems more to be talked about than practiced, not least due to the, to the firm presence of the state. Uh, the authors therefore um, uh, argue that instead of being politically motivated, such law talk um, is rather a non-instrumental form of uh, um, uh, portraying one's um, um, identity as a people. Uh, in contrast, the anti-dam oath clearly attests to a highly instrumental use uh, of, of the oath with an overt political claim without, however, going as far as to demand the recognition of Swan customary law by the Georgian state, as it had been occasionally proposed uh, in the 1990s. Um, and here, for one, there is the general question um, formulated by Jane and John Komarov, whether a Euro-modernist uh, nation state founded on the sovereignty of one law can um, actually infuse itself with uh, another jurisprudence. And we could ask whether Svan law, uh, concentrated as it is uh, on moral satisfaction, can implement um, the retributive uh, complement, I'm sorry, uh, can, if, if it can complement the retributive uh, state law. But today, such questions uh, seem to be hardly speakable, given that the Svans who make claims of difference um, uh, have come to speak from a highly peculiar position uh, from within the Georgian uh, nation. To be sure, over the past years, the encroachment of various infrastructural uh, projects has led SPAN activists to collaborate with environmental and legal NGOs to obtain national and international recognition as uh, indigenous people, which um, would grant them extended rights and control over their territory. However, um, besides the reluctance of a jealous nation state that does not even want to officially recognize Svan as a separate language, the articulation of the Svan's indigeneity is obstructed by the very way something like a Svan culture is being claimed by Svans themselves. Um, consider the rhetoric that transpires in the open letter regarding the Hudoni Dam that the community of Haishi addressed to Ivanishvili, as well as to the Catholicus Patriarch of the Georgian Orthodox Church. Uh, I quote, you know well Svaneti, its history, its language, ethnography and architecture, its polyphony and choreography, the unique Svan law and other unique characteristics which distinguish Svaneti from other corners of Georgia while enriching and complementing Georgian culture in general. Today, all of this is facing danger." End of quote. In insisting on their uh, irreducible difference, this difference gets articulated as an organic part of the one Georgian nation, while an excess always continues to room in the background, calling for a sustained effort to make this difference manageable and justifiable. Uh, and this nearly unspeakable um, um, uh, difference belongs to what Lawrence Brewers has called the inside story of Georgian nation building. While its roots lie in the Tsarist period, as illustrated by the role um, played of, uh, by the Georgian intelligentsia in the military trial of Halde, uh, Francine Hirsch and Claire Kaiser have shown that it was in the early Soviet period that um, due to the insistence of Georgian census takers, groups like Mingrelians and Svans were classified as subgroups internal to a dominant Georgian nation. Um, and these groups went, then were completely absorbed um, um, uh, into the Georgian nation in the census of uh, 1939, which reduced the number of ethnic groups in favor of a few major uh, and allegedly more advanced nationalities within the Soviet Union. Uh, and yet, uh, within this Georgian majority, Svans came to claim a certain kind of uh, seniority, um, um, turning into an advantage um, the difference that had been earlier cast as a civilizational lack. Um, 
for example, contrary to the claims um, um, of the centrist urban intelligentsia that Svan language was a mere dialect of Georgian, the leading articulators of the anti dam protests who are mostly members of the Svan intelligentsia, who are informed by uh, the Soviet concern for uh, ethnogenesis and history and linguistics, um, these people would speak of Svan as the mother tongue of Georgian itself. And in the interviews, they would engage uh, um, at length with what Rebecca Gould has called language dreaming, um, elaborating on etymologies of particular Svan words to prove their ancient pedigree and to use this uh, uh, detour through the past uh, to legitimate their claim to um, um, on the land that the Georgian nation state was disputing in the present. Um, so with Svaneti now presented as the living repository of an ancient Georgian culture, it was understandable that um, um, why uh, the main organizer of the protest in Khaishi uh, would insist on the oldness of the St. George Church that uh, the Hudoni Dam was meant to flood. As Paul Manning has remarked, being extremely old uh, is indeed seen as the defining attribute of um, um, Georgian uh, churches. Uh, and um, the, the organizer of the, the protest um, um, made sure to um, show me uh, all the um, original stones, all, all the original um, 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 old stones. Um, um, that had been built into the visibly uh, new construction um, uh, to claim that the church was uh, new, but uh, um, only so far as it was restored, uh, rebuilt by the locals themselves in the 1990s on the foundation of an older church. And again, here I'm not claiming that uh, he was inventing some kind of tradition. Um, what I want to emphasize is how uh, his claims are part of a complex set of strategies and constructions that subvert hegemonic understandings by participating in them. This uh, is ultimately most clearly visible in um, how this um, particular Church of St. George figures uh, in the text of the anti dam Oath, which itself is unique not only uh, for its political content, but also for having a written and print printed form, uh, which uh, allowed for wider circulation uh, and which allows us now for, um, um, uh, to engage in a closer reading. As a church functioning under the jurisdiction of the Georgian Orthodox Church, it partakes in what Florian Mulfrit has called the um, um, religious colonization of the highlands. Um, um, Mulfrit is speaking um, 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 about a similar context in the north of eastern um, um, Georgian mountains where the Georgian Orthodox uh, clerics are trying, not unlike the Russian uh, church in Cyrus times, to um, eradicate allegedly pagan uh, customs and to restore proper Christianity to the highlands. Uh, this spatial and temporal colonization is itself part of what Janelitsa has ident identified as the effort of the church to include salvation history uh, into the imminent secular uh, timeline of a Christian Georgian nation. And this ideological operation is then used by the post-Soviet uh, nation state uh, to root its own legitimacy by establishing an alliance with the Orthodox Church as the institution supposed to be uh, um, the material embodiment of the Christian and national uh, history uh, of, um, uh, of the national majority. Um, the text of the oath um, um, takes part both in the assertion of the church with the capital C as the pillar of the Georgian nation, um, as well as in uh, valuing particular churches as the material basis for specializing, uh, specializing the hegemonic national uh, nation, uh, uh, religious temporality. Um, as I was told uh, by, by the organizers themselves, um, the representatives of the Orthodox diocese um, um, in charge of Spanetti were those who provided the activists with what became the first part um, of a strangely assembled set of texts that formed the oath. Um, um, and this first part is um, uh, excerpted from um, uh, old Georgian translations, um, 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 which are a series of anathemas uh, usually read in Eastern Orthodox churches as um, 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 at the end of the liturgy of the triumph of orthodoxy, um, um, where um, those who do not worship the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as traitors and persecutors of the church and the homeland um, um, get cursed. Uh, this portion uh, of the oath was then um, um, followed by a somewhat convoluted declaration announcing the object of the oath and addressing the issue uh, on a uh, uh, national level. 
till finally came uh, the oath itself, uh, which reads um, um, the following way, um, um, I swear I will not spare my power and strength as well as my wit and reason do not permit for the St. George Church in Haishi, its graveyards, the community of Haishi, as well as the villages belonging to it to go underwater. Um, it is symptomatic that urban activists, as well as scholars sympathizing um, um, with the cause of the spans, have been all too willing to uh, concentrate on the second and third parts of the oath and to leave out the ecclesiastic curse as unreadable church stuff, um, um, difficult to register in what Assad would call a secular translation. And yet it is the very interconnection of the seemingly disparate uh, three parts that make for the subversive quality of the oath, which subsequently urged both the state um, uh, and Orthodox Church to deeply engage um, in mitigating the effects of this oath instead of uh, permitting themselves to ignore it as an exotic gesture uh, of a marginal group. Um, while the first part referred to the church as a wholly institutionalized body of the faithful, the church with a capital C, um, the third part collapsed this church with a capital C into literally the one material church of St. George in Haishi. It made nothing but this particular piece of architecture the object to which the oath committed itself, as if enacting uh, the perfect coincidence of words, things, and actions of God that Giorgio Agamben uh, has proposed to see as the essence of uh, any religious oath. In this sense, the order of the sites enlisted in the oath, uh, um, the church, the graveyard, um, um, uh, and the villages, uh, is equally significant, for here the church figures as the root of what um, uh, Webkin would call a bundle uh, enchain enchaining um, 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 all the um, other sites. Uh, with, the word, uh, of the, uh, um, uh, with the words of the oath literally clinging to the thing uh, which it swore to protect, the sworn were not simply refusing monetary compensation. First of all, they assured that um, um, the sworn things became as immovable as uh, their own words. And in doing this, the sworn detached themselves from the principal pillars of a modernist nation uh, state. Uh, um, for example, since the oath of every single uh, sworn engaged uh, the uh, entire extended family as well, the state and the investing company became unable to approach uh, um, these uh, individuals or these families uh, as uh, proprietors, as proprietors in the uh, liberal sense, with whom a contract could be uh, a bargain or a compensation could be bargained. Even more importantly, the sworn affronted the reliance of the capitalist state uh, um, on uh, undisrupted movability and interchangeability of people and things. State officials were urged to use every means to tame the disruption produced by the oath. They started to accuse the sworn of going um, um, against the state and made sure to associate the swearing on an icon with the swearing on the Quran, implicitly connecting the intransigence of the swans uh, to the orientalist stereotypes of fanaticism and uh, fundamentalism. And, um, and after the uh, largest oath, the third oath, uh, the state turned to the Orthodox Church to mobilize its authority. Uh, and prominent clerics um, um, speaking in the name of the ecclesiastic center immediately started uh, um, uh, declaring the, to the media that the oath of the Spans and swearing in general was against the gospel and that this was a problem of mentality uh, faced by people in faraway peripheries. Uh, with which basically the church contributed to the modernist secular effort of the state to produce flexible uh, citizens who do not hold uh, too strong convictions uh, uh, that would hinder the state to move them around uh, when uh, necessary. Um, when confronted uh, with the immovability of people, words and things, the state proposed to bargain a flooding level that would leave the church untouched. So this was the next uh, uh, thing they tried. Uh, the community responded that the church without the community was of no use. Um, the state then proposed to have the St. George Church and the graveyards relocated to wherever the community of Haishi would resettle. The community responded that the church has its own foundation angel, thus claiming that it was unthinkable to displace or replace that enchained environment where the divine, the dead, and the living come together in the setting of the Nguri uh, uh, Valley in this particular um, um, uh, place. 
Um, as nothing worked to unglue the sworn bundle of words, things, and actions, the Svan representatives of the central government ultimately negotiated with the Diocese of Spanetti to have the oath lifted. Uh, in other words, uh, to unswear the sworn, uh, notwithstanding the basic rule of the game that an oath can either only be maintained or broken at the risk of uh, incurring divine violence. So, um, and this is an, was an unthinkable thing, and this is a conflict that largely remains in the wings and is uh, only reluctantly uh, spoken of um, by uh, the Spans. Since the oath pledged in 2013, other communities in Svaneti have been resorting uh, to the customary oath uh, taking um, um, in the um, effort to counter other private transnational investments, uh, be it on hydropower plants or cyanide extraction of gold, or as just a week ago, to restrain local households from privately overexploiting energy resources for the sake of crypto mining. However, while the oath against the Hudoni Dam was eminently political in its clear cut distinction between friend and enemy, the rise of crypto mining confronts the community not only with the difficulty of identifying the enemy, but also with the threat of the dissolving the community. Uh, altogether, as a considerable number of locals uh, revealed to be involved uh, um, uh, in mining uh, cryptocurrency themselves, um, the enemy seems to be dispersed among all the individual households that possess um, a crypto miner. Uh, at the gathering in the church uh, on the 13th of December, even the local priest, the same one who participated in the rallies uh, against the Hudoni Dam, confessed to possess one miner. He begged for forgiveness and swore to shut it down forever. While in the case uh, of top-down infrastructural projects, the state did not shy from uh, um, uh, using force. In 2021, the state, administratively and technically more powerful and present than ever, is unwilling and incapable to do anything as it is hostage to its own deregulated economic logic and the private interests of powerful politicians. The word to emerge all the time in this context is powerlessness. The police, the municipality, the people, everyone seems powerless in the face of this new challenge. And as the state plays dead, the Svan self-organize uh, again according to um, the customary rule that charges divine transcendence with the sovereign prerogative to enforce an order that the state won't guarantee. This oath could then be seen as a pledge um, 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 as an oath um, um, pledged by um, um, stately beings, uh, to borrow um, Michael Dowsick's term, for um, um, an oath for the sake of a sovereign um, um, state uh, and for a sovereignty that is lacking, uh, but that um, one nevertheless does not want to allow for uh, um, um, to collapse. Um, Significantly, the swearing was preceded by a long impassioned debate in the church whether the gathered uh, should swear at all, for they were also painfully aware uh, that they were being watched by the entire nation to whom they now had to prove that the swan oath was still in force. Um, ultimately, some doubted uh, um, the usefulness of the oath um, also because of the uncertainty as to who possessed crypto miners and uh, if they all were swans. Uh, who would actually play with the rules uh, of a customary oath. Be uh, as it may, after the swearing of the oath on, uh, um, um, on the icon of uh, St. Uh, George, um, it was reported that Nestia was receiving electricity without disruptions, but later the electric company announced that while uh, there were no disruptions uh, anymore on the transmission lines, um, um, nevertheless, um, energy consumption in Svaneti had not decreased since the 30th of December, um, they claimed. Um, for many lowlanders, this uh, provided the perfect pretext to uh, continue mocking the uh, pathetic mountaineers who had uh, thought St. George would somehow um, slay the crypto dragon. And um, one could conclude maybe by saying that one certainly does not have to uh, question the sovereign power uh, of St. George, but one might have to ask whether there still is a community that uh, could function as the address of something like a striking uh, divine violence. And this is uh, how I will end and we'll see how things will evolve um, uh, in the coming months. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your presentation. And now we have some time left for questions. Um, so if you have a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen uh, to input your question. 
Um, and uh, here we have a number of them coming in. Um, and I will start with the question from Professor uh, Harsha Ram, uh, who first thanks you for your fascinating talk. Uh, and asks, do you regard Svan oath-taking as fundamentally distinct from the law or simply another kind of law? Um, he says that as he sees it, both imply a kind of coercive force understood to be binding. But if law can be seen as the impersonal expression of the state as an already constituted power, then oaths can be seen as an intentional performance, one that relies on what some have called constituent as against constituted power. Do you think this is a useful distinction or is oath-taking as customary law simply a more archaic manifestation of the principle of law in general? Um, yes, thank you for that question. It's um, that touches a very fundamental point. Um, I would, I would, I, maybe I would, the only thing I could say uh, um, at this point is that uh, um, um, both, both, it's also a law, um, um, and bo bo both forms of law uh, imply some kind of uh, logics of power. That's um, um, that's that's certain. It's not that. Um, um, simply because it's not a written law that is enforced by uh, um, a sovereign state, um, that it's uh, um, completely egalitarian or uh, democratic, right? There is, there is some kind of violence uh, um, um, uh, involved, but um, at least in um, a context where there is a, a strong presence of the state precisely, um, this customary law, um, 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 uh, becomes able to outsource uh, violence to a transcendent divine force uh, uh, and not to have any any human being uh, who is part of this fun community, for example, um, be in charge of uh, enforcing uh, what um, uh, the mediators of a customer litigation um, were also um, um, only um, uh, always elected, and because uh, it, it's not a permanent uh, position that they um, are taken. Um, um, so th there's there's no 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 um, um, no permanent um, 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 human uh, instance that would be in charge of uh, um, um, implementing uh, what has been decided. That is why again um, uh, any decision um, 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 that is. Um, um, uh, taken within uh, a customary litigation um, has to be um, um, asserted by um, um, another oath um, by both parties um, that they will remain faithful to the decision. And if anyone were to break uh, um, 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 the oath, again, there will be only um, the divine force that will be in charge of uh, providing punishment. But uh, in, so in so far as both uh, kinds of law entail uh, a certain uh, relation uh, of power, um, yeah, uh, that, that kind of um, um, a distinction um, uh, is certainly useful, but um, um, I, I think I would have to think about, um, um, about that more reframe um, the question um, accordingly. Another question has come through from Andrew Berry, um, who thanks you for your rich analysis of the oath, its history and its politics, and asks, um, how do you see the relation or the difference between the protests in Svanetti and elsewhere, for instance, in the Makfani, and how much do they inform or differ from each other? And are there differences yes, the, of the state and the actions of the church in both of them? That's uh, the, the this big social movement uh, uh, around the um, no less massive Namahwani hydropower plant, uh, which started um, um, last year, uh, at the end of 2019. Um, uh, is um, um, what is um, um, deter determining the, 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 the present momentum, basically, in the environmental struggles uh, in Georgia. And um, I've, I've uh, tried to um, 
um, not talk, talk about Namukhwani at all because um, the Svan uh, resistance against Hudoni um, has uh, come to be seen as uh, a kind of precursor uh, to the Namukhwani um, 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 uh, struggle, which somehow somehow debases the the, 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 the independent quality that, that uh, um, um, we can discern in, in the Svan. Um, um, struggle but of course there is there is uh, both uh, um, struggles share um, um, a very forceful religious dimension um, um, for one uh, in the Namahwani uh, movement the leaders are one of the main uh, leaders of the movement are uh, from a, um, um, a family of a, um, a local priest um, and they use uh, icons, crosses, prayers, uh, many things to also somehow mark uh, um, territories that they want to disembed from uh, circulation on the market, so to say. Um, but um, um, at the same time, one can say that um, um, the, 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 the leaders or the, 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 the participants of the Nahwani movement are much more directly affiliated to the church. They, they, are, they are basically um, a very traditional um, Georgian um, um, parish, so to say, right? Representatives of a Georgian uh, uh, parish, and they are embodiments, perfect embodiments of uh, um, the Georgian majority, like uh, healthy peasants who, who are Orthodox, who speak Georgian, who live uh, uh, in the countryside, um, but who have come to somehow uh, articulate things that are somewhat uh, um, um, unpleasant for the state, whereas the Svans are, are this 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 somewhat uh, unsettling uh, um, uh, twin brothers uh, who um, uh, claim to be Christians, claim to be uh, good Georgians, but always maintaining this kind this difference where. The church and the state uh, always also have to somehow push back and 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 uh, uh, maintain some kind of um, colonial difference uh, with, with with regard to them um, to keep that that difference mitigated. Um, and this is also what has um, um, uh, enabled the Svans to remain much more independent uh, uh, from intervention uh, on the part of the church, uh, which unfortunately was not the case uh, uh, with the Namakwani movement which at some point uh, uh, just last year had to basically uh, um, follow um, 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 a call um, from the church uh, to uh, join uh, um, in an um, um, anti-LGBT rally, uh, which also somehow discredited the, um, the uh, rhetorics uh, and the ethics of nonviolence that the Namakhani movement was, was uh, preaching and practicing. So yeah, you have, you have this kind of uh, difference uh, um, um, while both movements share a very, very um, strong um, um, religious uh, commitment and, and um, repertoire of um, 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 tools of resistance. Another question that has come in from Adele Margolis, um, who thanks you for an illuminating presentation, is do you think that the peripheralization of the Svan people by the Georgian government and the Orthodox Church uh, of Svanetti aids or hinders the Svan cause of being held nationally and internationally as a discrete nation, people, culture, language? Well, certainly that, that is a major uh, factor because, um, and there is also a kind of self-censorship uh, at work uh, among the Svans who, uh, um, as I try to argue, always have to present themselves as, as uh, not only good Georgians, but uh, as the better Georgians, as the older Georgians, right? Who are, uh, who speak a language that is the older uh, version of uh, a common language from which then Georgian, Mingrelian, uh, um, 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 and Span um, um, uh, um, split um, apart. Um, it's um, 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 it also there's this kind of this kind of um, 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 resistance on the part of the state and the church um, uh, certainly also helps um, um, this well let's, let's phrase it differently um, because the spans are not uh, the kind of um, 
the perfect embodiment of a Georgian national minority, like the protesters, um, 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 the activists of the Nahrani movement. Um, they, they, they certainly had more problems also to communicate their, their concerns to the broader national public. At the same time, precisely because there was a kind of um, a very strong um, a presence of the community in Svaneti, uh, where they could rely on some sort of um, um, customary law, which would enforce consolidation within uh, the community. Um, they also had the luxury to not have to reach out to uh, uh, um, um, the broader audience, right? Although they were always um, um, collaborating with uh, various NGOs, etc. Um, the the Namakhani movement, on the, on the uh, other hand, because they uh, they were in a in a part um, in Western Georgia where. Um, it's basically already empty, uh, and where they could not rely on any any functioning um, local tradition uh, that would be uh, um, similar to to um, the Svan oath. Uh, they had to immediately reach out to the broader public uh, and engage in a sort of um, deliberative uh, politics, where they would also engage the state in uh, discussing uh, the issues instead of uh, being able to or having the luxury like the Svans to just cut off any discussion by by uh, pledging an oath, which means no discussion, right? It's uh, um, 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 yeah. So. Um, that 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 is another difference um, where we can where we can use the the, the um, um, comparison with uh, Namahwani to uh, see um, what made the Svan um, resistance both uh, more powerful maybe uh, 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 and did not lead it into the kind of discretion that the Namahwani movement had to uh, um, undergo last year uh, the uh, anti-LGBT rally, um, but also to explain why the reach of uh, the Svan struggle remained uh, much more limited. Uh, so we're roughing, running up uh, at the end to the end of our session, uh, but we do have two more questions. Um, and uh, there's another question from um, uh, Professor Harsha Ram here, who uh, said that you began talking about Bitcoin uh, as a market force. It obviously differs from modernizing projects of the nation state. So do you see Bitcoin as the intrusion of global speculative markets into the everyday lives of Svans? Or is it a self-empowering way for players from the global peripheries to make money? Well, both uh, um, in a certain sense, because um, um, the, the 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 flourishing of uh, this this um, uh, um, uh, crypto mining is uh, um, um, uh, uh, is made possible by the same modernizing uh, um, um, framework of the, of, uh, the, the Georgian nation state, which. Uh, Promotes hydropower plants or other kinds of infrastructural projects as well. It's it's uh, b b both are based on the fundamental deregulation of uh, um, uh, economic investment, right, and of uh, um, um, how uh, you will exploit uh, uh, nature and uh, energy resources. Uh, and it is, one could say, um, um, an infiltration of uh, the logic of profit with, with, within the subjectivities of, of, of the, the, um, the locals uh, themselves. This is this this in this sense. It is certainly um, uh, it's new. But uh, overall, I, I think um, um, both um, um, the top-down infrastructural projects and this this kind of um, 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 intrusion of crypto mining as um, a source for the locals to to just generate free money are um, two sides of the same um, same coin. That's uh, that's yeah, what I could say. And then our last question um, asks you to speculate a bit um, and shifts the focus back uh, to the dam uh, and ask what you think will happen. Will the dam ever be built? Um, it's on hold. Uh, um, 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 it's it's frozen. And yeah, the, the oath is still in force. Uh, 
but um, they are they are looking for a new company. Um, and uh, Namahwani also is on hold, but uh, none of it has uh, really definitely been uh, withdrawn by by the state. So we will see. Okay. Well, uh, with that, um, uh, we come to the end of our session, and I would just like to thank you again very much for your thought-provoking presentation and uh, for being able to join us today uh, here at Stanford. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye, everyone.